Hey to all of our social media family, and we've got a wonderful face that you see here with me, Pastor Miles McPherson, who uh, we've been evolving in our relationship. I got to meet him a little over a year ago as he sat in the middle of an airplane aisle, and we talked all the way from Dallas back to California, had a wonderful relationship, has been budding ever since, and I've been pressing, I think, but between me and CNN and everybody else, this man has been swamped with interviews, but I pressed and pressed because I told him, I said, I feel like you're the guy. So for those of you who may not be familiar with him, Masters of Divinity at Azusa Pacific in 1991, authored eight books, the latest, the third option, which he's going to tell you a little bit about in a minute. And he started his uh, church, Rock Church in San Diego, 2000, reaches over 18,000 weekly, four services, five campus, radio, TV, broadcast, you name it, and the list goes on. I only read about one-third of the list because I want to give him time to talk. And, of course, he had that wonderful pro career in football. God has done a lot, blessed you. I think you're a wonderful leader in the kingdom. And, uh, and I really, really handpicked you of one of three people that I wanted to interview because maybe I can bring some people to the table that would normally not be there and use my influence and, and let you speak into it because I believe you've got something to say. I'm not going to be hypocritical. I've read the cliff notes of, the, um, of your book, The Third Option. Tell us a little bit about the book, what we could expect if we've got it, and, uh, and why you wrote the book, Pastor. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And I do remember that conversation on the plane and uh, I've been praying for that conversation and all that we were talking about. I'll give you context and hello to everybody. Um, uh, I grew up in New York had a white grandmother, two black grandfathers, and a half black Chinese grandmother. Thus, I have this beautiful brown tan skin. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I grew up, I was born in 1960, so my neighborhoods were segregated. So I went, lived in a black neighborhood, went to school for eight years in a white neighborhood, got harassed in the white neighborhood because I wasn't white, got harassed in the black neighborhood because I wasn't black wow. enough. Wow. But my house was United Nations, football teams were diverse, and we all got along great in those areas. And even in my neighborhood, it wasn't that bad. It was worse in a white neighborhood for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was eight, Martin Luther King was killed. And I remember feeling how unfair it was and how, what can we do? Thinking, you know, what do we do? He yeah. was the guy. And all my life, I've dealt with it. My family's dealt with it and been thinking, I got to do something and do something. And I remember when Ronnie, I mean, uh, when, uh, OJ was acquitted, how divided the country was. I preached that, that, that weekend and cried. It was, you know, I didn't realize how much pain I was carrying. And so when he wrote this book, I, I wrote this book called The Third Option because I wanted to give people tools on how to honor. We live in a, in a divided us versus them culture. And it's for or against the police, for uh -huh. Black Lives, Republican, Democrat, American, immigrant. You can go on and on and on about the division. And the devil is all about two, and God is about one. Mm -hmm. Unity is one, division is two. And the devil says, you got to be on one side or the other. It's us versus them. And those are your two options. And once you choose one option, you can't ever agree with the other option. Mm -hmm. And when you read J Joshua chapter 5, when Joshua was leading Israelites into the promised land, he, he, he's confronted by the command of the Lord's army. And he says to the command of the Lord's army, are you for us or our adversary? Mm -hmm. And so if you're on one side, the other side are the adversaries. That, that's the human culture. The right. culture of the world is division and opposition. So Joshua says to the Lord, he don't know he's the Lord. He says, are you for us or our adversaries? Because we're getting ready to go to take the promised land. And God says, No. <laughs> he doesn't say I'm on your side or this side. He says, right. I don't, I reject both those options. Mm -hmm. There's a third option. And, and he, and he says, as command of the, of the Lord's army, you know, take your shoes off. And then Joshua bowed down. And what the Lord was saying to him is like, this whole, this whole thing, uh, the promised land is my idea. It's not right. your idea. Yeah. Justice is not man's idea. It's God's idea. God's idea. And so the third option is that we honor what we have in common you know, we have more similarities than differences. By far. We all bleed red. We all made an image of God. We all love our food, our pillow, our family. We all want purpose. We're all on a journey. And if we focus on all the things that we have in common, uh, we would get along. So the third option is all about how do we, how do we overcome the barriers of culture 
to acknowledge, understand what we have in common, and then begin to value them and express that value. So I wrote this book to give people tools on how to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I love what you're saying there because this upcoming week, I'll go ahead and put a plug in for me. I'm going to be talking about the encounter when Jesus said, I need to go to Samaria. You know, the, the Jews thought that the Samaritans were dogs. I mean, Assyria had in, invaded Israel in 722, and the Assyrians that stayed there married some of the Jewish people, and they got referred to as Samaritans. And the Samaritans resented the Jews. The Jews thought they were better than Samaritans. And I noticed something when I was studying, preparing this message. When Jesus said, I need to go to Samaritan, then he sent the rest of the disciples into town to buy food because they would not have been ready for that encounter mm -hmm. because all of them were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had an encounter, a cross-cultural encounter, and it was a difficult encounter. But mm -hmm. before Jesus talked to her about his theology, he reached her with his sociology. In other words, all she knew was he was just a kind man. Mm -hmm. But men don't usually associate with me. Jews don't usually associate with me. He reached out with kindness. I, I have been one of those crossover guys for 30 years, and I do have a significant number of Caucasian Americans, white folk, uh, that have been a part of our ministry. Let's say that some of those are listening now and at the table, really paying attention to something they've not really paid attention to for the first time, what would you say to them? Whew. Uh, first, I would tell you, God loves you. Yes. And, and the culture I know is going to beat down on you and make you feel guilty. And uh, God loves you. And there's going to be a steep learning curve because this is going to be new to you. Um, and it's going to be somewhat difficult and different. That is true. When I several things I would say when I was when I saw George Floyd killed and I'm 60 something triggered in me that I had never thought about and has never impacted me like this I I, I felt like I real I realized that all this time uh, because of the racism I, I experienced I had been living under a cloud of powerlessness to white culture and so I've been telling my church look and the white people in my church listen you, you need to use your power to help fix this because you, white people have more power when all things are equal than black people. When I say all things are equal, you have to, you know, white and black and then same money, same everything, white voices or foul, but white people can get on the phone and say, a black man is threatening my life, a police will come. You know, but it's black man, right? right. Not that it, if it was a white man, but it's just different. You, you know, the, the police come a little quicker. But, so why, to use your voice. Um, number two, understand that we all have blind spots Yes. A blind spot is the gap between your intent and your impact. And I talk to thousands and thousands, literally, of people who say, I'm not a racist. That may be true, but you can be racially offensive and not be a racist. I'm going to say that one more time, because what, what happens is if you think that being racially offensive means you're a racist, which some people will say that to you, but I'm going to show you that it's not necessarily true. That you can actually be, I, I love all people, I, want, I really want to be nice, but you just don't know how. Mm -hmm. And in trying to build bridges, you can actually be offending people unknowingly. I've if experienced you, that. You're right. You, I've experienced that myself in my learning curve, doing things I had no clue was, was offensive to a black American. And then when I found out, I was horrified about it. Speak to that further. I think you're on something. Right. And so, so if you say, I don't see color, which is a very common bridge builder. However, uh, what you're saying is, I see you as, so, I'm not going to let color uh, impact negatively how I treat you. That's what I think most people are meaning. The problem is, you're telling somebody who is brown or eight, whatever they are, that you just erase that from your sight and your, and your thought process. When in fact, God gave them that color, so it's, it's to his glory that they are that color. But that color also has a burden. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens that you may fulfill the law of Christ. Well, if you are going to ignore the burden that comes with my color because you're not going to acknowledge the color, how are you going to bear the burden, which means how are you going to love me? And when this person told me this, they said, I don't see your color. I thought they had an eye stigmatism because I had never heard that term. Because <laughs> where I grew up, you see color, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> And, 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 and by the way, your, your brain processes like 100 million bits of information a second. 90% comes, 
comes through your eyes. So wow. your eye is worth is 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 responsible for about ninety percent of your brain activity. And so when you say you don't see color, you're just lying to yourself. Right. Uh, and by the way, people only say it when they see color. Two white people talking to each other don't say that to each other. Okay. And so, but but so what you're saying is that when you see when you when you don't say you see color, you're saying you don't see my burden. And so when these people told me that, they, I said, "What do you see?" And they said, we don't see your color. I was like, if you see green, yellow, gray, how do you know I don't have a color you shouldn't see? And so it's just a hypocritical um, uh, untruth. Now, what's your intent is not your impact. Now, some people, so some people get, to get offended, you're gonna say, I'm not a racist, therefore that's not offensive. Well, that's not necessarily true. Who determines the offense is the person who received it. And so I would say that we, if, if, you're, if you're white, this conversation and these conversations about race are things that you in general haven't been a part of as much as people of color, because we deal with it all the time, at least with us. You haven't been in conversations with us. And so there's going to be a steep learning curve and you're going to have blind spot. There are going to be things you don't know, you don't know. That is uncomfortable, but it is a process that you're going to have to go through. In, in my book, when I describe racism, I describe it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different kind of way, even though I do give the, the official uh, description, but I talk about people being in different groups. We all are in multiple groups. Men are a group, women are a group, married men are a group, grandfathers are a group. So we're all in multiple groups. If someone's in part of one of those groups, they're part of your in-group. If someone's not a part of a group, they're part of your out-group. When you, when you identify the people in your in-group, there's a thing called the homogeneity effect, which means that you understand the variations of the people in that group. You and I are pastors and we're pastors of the mega church. So if I meet a pastor and he says, I have 20 people in, in the church, I know that he, there's things I deal with, he doesn't have any idea. That's but good. if I meet a pastor who has thousands, I go, okay, we can talk about all kinds of stuff, employees and drama and taxes and da 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 building and, you know, because we, we understand the variations of our in-group. By definition, you don't understand the variations of your out-group. You may, some people may be, uh, you know, uh, um, tendency to say people, Spanish speakers without realizing there's all kinds of different Spanish to the degree that you can hear two Spanish speakers and they might understand each other mm -hmm. because the Spanishes can be so different from say Puerto Rico to Mexico. And, um, and so, but you don't know that because that's your out-group, so therefore, if you're white, non-whites are your out-group, and there's probably a whole lot you don't know that you don't even know because it's your out-group. It's like when, when you meet, I'll meet people and they'll say, well, I had a black friend. They got one. Right. That doesn't mean you understand that group. You understand that person because all black people don't think alike, don't, don't vote the same, don't, don't, don't act the same, and don't see the world the same. Mm -hmm. Now, there are similarities, but just because you know, you know one doesn't right. mean you know all. Right. to accept the fact that you don't know what you don't know and just be humbly be a learner. And if you can humbly be a learner and through this process and not have to be right. In America, white culture is usually, white people are usually the teacher, usually the boss, usually the leader. And so you're accustomed to that. It's very rare that um, white people are following black people. And so this is an opportunity, it gonna, might be a little strange for people to say, I'm gonna learn from people who usually I didn't learn from. And so those are, those are the things that, that God's gonna produce. Now, I would tell you this, this is a spiritual issue. You have to see this as a spiritual issue and an opportunity to grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. the, the, racism is spiritual before it's governmental, before it's economic, before it's judicial. It is a spiritual issue. It is people who say the image of God in me is superior to the image of God in you because of your color. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the ramifications uh, socially, economically, judicially are the fallout of, of sin. Mm -hmm. And so as you go, as you're white, as you go into this to say, Lord, teach me about me and not necessarily that you're racist, what don't I know about me? What don't I know about my pride? What don't I know about how I've seen the world and been taught to see the world all my life because of my culture? Uh, be, because our culture 
will, culture will teach this group you're better, will teach this group you're not as good. And that has ramifications spiritually. Yes, it does. You know what? It's, it's amazing you say that. This uh, last night, this morning, I went to Luke 21 and those, uh, were you raised in church, Pastor? Were you, were you raised in church? I went to Catholic school, Catholic yeah, church. Okay. Uh, I, I was a church boy. I mean, church boy. My dad was a small town pastor and all, I, we did church seven days a week in some form or fashion. So I was a church boy. And we have those scriptures that when we heard guest speakers preach on, you know, the end time things, we, they just scared us to death, you know. And Luke 21, when the disciples said, when, what are the signs of the times and when will these things be? Jesus basically started talking about when things are going to start winding down. I don't want to go into an end time speech because I'm not deep enough in that area. And then he started listing, these are the things you're going to see. And every single verse in that chapter was a verse about division. It'll be kingdom against kingdom. It'll be nation against nation. It'll be parent against child. It'll be mother against father. It'll be husband. I mean, it's just division, division. He said, this is what you're going to see when things start winding down. Everybody is going to go to their corner and point toward each other. And, uh, and I just had a hunch. I took one year of Greek. That's just enough to get in trouble. But I had a hunch that word nation was going to say ethnos. And I looked it up and it did. That actually means race. It doesn't mean a national entity is going to rise up against another at national. He said it's going to be race rising up against race in the end time. And then he said in verse 13, he said, but for you, it will be an occasion for testimony. In other words, he charged his disciples, do not get infected by the disease you're trying to cure. Do you think the church could shine at this moment if we could get our act together? You know, you, you hear the, the term, the church is the hope of the world. It cannot be more true than right now. Um, again, the world is fighting. I'm going to win over you. I'm going to dominate over you. It's always been that fight. One group trying to dominate the other group. And God is like, that's not my fight. Right. I want all, you know, the, in, the, in the world, you have activists. Activists is my side is right. My side is right. Then you have pacifists, which means, ah, let's just all get along. God has called us to be prophetic and to say there is something higher for all of us to aspire to, and that's the glory of God, the kingdom of God, that I will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we will bring the kingdom here and not just get saved so we can go up there. And so if we can elevate the love of God, the power of God, the spirit of God, the anointing of God in unity, and that God would change hearts, politics and laws aren't going to change people's hearts. Laws are necessary, all that's necessary. However, if the heart isn't changed, it's just gonna be a fight over loopholes in the law. But if, if, I, if I commit to loving you, if I commit to serving you and you serving me, we're gonna get along. And so the church has to demonstrate that first. We have to live out the third option first. We we're praying for each other, confessing our sins one to another, uh, serving one another, sharing and being transparent and vulnerable willing to be wrong and willing to forgive one another uh, in the process. And when the world sees that, they're going to say, okay, that's a path forward. Yeah. And another thing, I, I love the way, I love the way you're speaking this angle of it, because when I was pastoring and I want, I started off, my, uh, a lot of our, our growth has come in the two years now that I've been in California and I'm grateful for that. But a lot of people only know me in this context and do not know that I spent 27 years in the Deep South in a town that most people have never heard of. And uh, I went, South Carolina was the last state in the nation, the last, the 50th, to adopt an MLK holiday. Hmm. I was in the last county <laughs> of the last state. So I was in the last county of the last state, the very last county in the United States of America to adopt an MLK holiday. And I went there in 91 at the age of 21 and said I was going to have a multicultural church. So you might imagine people didn't line up on the sidewalk and clap when I rode into town. Um, there was no crossover ministry that I know of at all that existed anywhere. If it existed, it was in somebody's house or something. That certainly wasn't a public demonstration of it. And um, it was a very, very difficult run. And for about seven or eight years, we had no breakthrough. It took me about a decade to break that through. And here was something I saw, Pastor. When I became intentional, I think there are leaders, pastors, and even 
God's people, church people, that think that multiculturalism or cross-culturalism happens naturally. That has not been my experience. It has been intentional every time. So whenever I wanted to cross over, I started looking at inequity everywhere, equity in the parking lot, equity on the stage, equity in my offices, equity in my children. If the children did the Christmas play, equity in how the solos were distributed. And my antennas were up high all the time. And then all of a sudden, my words didn't ring hollow to the black community anymore. This man means what he says because it was being demonstrated in front of them. I didn't, we didn't, I didn't plan on asking you this beforehand, but you're a big boy, so I'm going to ask you, what would you say for preachers who need to show that they're building a bridge to a people who don't look like them? Uh, relationship. <clears throat> Build the bridge. Have a relationship. Again, if you think white pastors usually, and this is just my experience, come to my church, we're doing something here. Wrong. Come to my neighborhood. Uh, instead of, I'm going to come to you, break bread on your terms, That's and good. get you on your property, and honor you. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about relationship. I mean, go, go hang out. Go hang out. Eat. Share stories. Uh, spend time together. It's from the relationship. It, and, and that is true of even all your white congregants and black congregants. Well, your white congregants, how many people, are, how many blacks have you had have you in your house or you, whose house you've been? How many relationships do you have? And it, once that happens, everything, everything breaks loose from there. It's not a matter of, okay, I got I to gotta get these five answers to these five questions and now I'm good. It's about relationship. And if we can, if it, if we can keep it as simple as that, from relationships, you'll learn so much about culture. You'll learn so much about yourself. So many questions will be answered. Uh, and, and then when you start hearing your friends and family say stuff, it's like, hold on, I got firsthand experience. Yes. You know, it's yes. not an anecdote of the out group. They're now part of my in group because we have now shared all these things we have in common. And we now we're in group of, of soccer coach, of soccer parents, or you know, football parents, or you know, whatever club you know you're in. Now that's the focal point. What you have in common versus your differences. My white co-laborers in the ministry that have we've talked, who are horrified at what they saw, and truly want to be a part of the solution have called me, said, okay, you, you've been doing this for 30 years. What do I have to do? What do I have to do? What do I have to do? And this is what I've responded to them. I'm open to you correcting me on this. I don't know that cross-cultural, you know, ministry and brotherhood is something that you can do. In fact, nobody wants to be, uh, nobody wants to be somebody else's project. I don't want to be somebody's project. But I told him, I said, I don't think it's what you do. I said, I think it's what you are. A seed produces after its own kind. And I told him, I said, it was always who I am. Now, I will, I will agree. I think people who were involved in athletics, I, didn't, I went to college on basketball. I didn't have the skill set to go as far as you did. But it's hard to, to be in sports and not have a little glimpse into other people's lives. I mean, so I think that gives people a head start. And I was, as, as soon as I could pick a ball up, I was playing ball. And uh, so I was used to uh, hearing another language, seeing life through another lens, hearing people talk that were not raised in a world that I was raised in. That was common for me. But there are people who have not. They have never been outside of, of their world. So I think it's something that you become I don't think it's something that you can do. Would you agree with me on that? I don't think you, I don't think there's seven steps to multicultural ministry. I think it's something that has to happen in you. Yeah, I think, I think if I can rephrase their question is what do I do? What do I got to do to become it? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, and it goes back to relationship. If you start hanging out with people, um, I, I was, I, I, this will probably be to illustrate your, your answer. And I'm agreeing with you. There was a guy, I was walking into a public high school in Philly to do an assembly. It was a black Puerto Rican school in, in um, um, I think it was West Philly High. And I'm walking in with this youth pastor who was from Jersey, he was a white guy. And he stops me right before we go in. He says, how do I act? Which is what you're saying, what do I gotta do? And I said to him, be yourself. yourself. 
And I said, if you're, you're, if you are, you you can't act good enough to fool anybody. So just know that. But if you, if you just act yourself, they will see you're authentic. Now, unless you're a knucklehead, right? But they'll see you're authentic, and then, then you can build bridges. So I think it's be yourself and be humble enough to say, I don't know what I know. One of the ways to learn your blind spots is simply ask. It's like, look, I want to, you know, I want to know what I don't know. Can you help me and go to someone who's different than you and say, am I, is it something I say or do that's racially offensive? Can I say this? Can I say this? And if you humbly want to know, I will tell you something, a little inside secret of people of color. People of color are tired of educating white people. And what I mean by that is that we seem like we have to say the same thing over and over again, over and over again, to prove that there's racism or to prove and to prove that our experience is different. And it's like, no one wants to believe it. Now people want to believe it. But it has been a long-standing conversation. Yeah. Like, I keep saying the same thing over and over again. And, and now people say, okay, now I want to learn. And so to, to say, I want to learn and find someone that will help you walk you by the hand and, and teach you and spend time with you and answer your questions, you are going to have amazing friends. Your, your world is going to be transformed overnight and and this is going to be a blessing god never never lets us be tempted with what we can't handle and with every tempt, every temptation or burden or trial he gives us a way out this is going to be so revolutionary for us in our relationship with jesus this is about our relationship with jesus how to be more like jesus how to how to have more compassion for people who have been marginalized and oppressed that's what this is about i am um we're coming up on that half hour and, I, and I've, you've done a, two or three times as many of these as I have. And I've had some that ran an hour and a half and that's totally too long. So yeah. I just said, you know, I want to do these things about 30 minutes and we're, and we're on that mark right now. And I want to give you your last comments to speak. Number one, uh, Ron Carpenter Ministries is going to buy 500 of your books. And all of you who would like to read Pastor's Third Option, if you'll go to the website right there, if you'll go to our website and you will register, we'll have a place for you to register. We're going to give those away. If we have significantly more than 500 register, we'll do our best to buy more. I want to get your word out there. And if they want to go buy it on their own, I'm certain, I guess it's on Amazon. They can yeah, I would go to uh, Barnes and Noble first. I would go to Barnes and Noble. Barnes yeah. and Noble first. And uh, if they don't, have, if they don't want to go through me, my way is going to be a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah. uh, they to come my route. I'm yeah. cheaper than Barnes and Noble, but I just want to do that to be a blessing. Thank you for being with me and get the word out. Let me tell you where I am. Uh, I understand people are hurting deeply. I watched what everybody else saw. I was I was mortified at what I what I saw, and and then I went through a little bit of a personal depression. I don't want to make this about me, but I've given my whole life to it in my, and I was like going to God. I'm like, God, are we really still here? We we're really here 30 years of, of chopping down this tree and everything I've done with the influence I have. And we're right here. And I didn't want to accept it. I just did not want to accept it. I wanted to believe that we had moved the needle uh, further than that. I will tell you though, I am hopeful pastor. Um, I think when it's all said and done, it's a horrible way to do it, but George Floyd may have changed the world because I'm going to tell you what I am seeing. I'm seeing people willing to talk who have never been willing to talk. I'm seeing people come to the table that have never come to the table. I'm seeing police, you know, that blue blood runs deep. I'm seeing police officers calling each other out. I'm, I'm seeing some things happen. I'm seeing a crack in the dam that in my lifetime, in my, let me qualify that, in my lifetime that I have never seen before. So I'm hopeful. Give somebody some hope in your closing comments that maybe, just maybe, we're in the midst of a turning point. Could that be possible? Yeah, yeah, and I'll give it to you two ways. God has got a hope. And every time you read the Bible about the end times, we always get scared, you know, this evil's gonna happen and the fire is gonna come out of heaven. But in every time God talks about the end or he always says, but I will be glorified and I will return and I will redeem my people. So this is not like, you know, God can't handle this. This right. is all part of he is using what the devil meant for evil to, to bring something good. When I wrote the book, I uh, came out two years ago, a year and a half. 
at that time, I was I went to so many churches, white churches, that I know two years before that would have never wanted to yes. talk about. Yes. And like, please, please, please. Come. Now it's like a floodgate. Yep. And I want you to imagine uh, the majority of the people in America who are white are saying, we've been ignoring this all f- for 400 years. They don't want to talk about it. Now we want to talk about it. And here's what I'm saying. We want to talk about, and this is a, a, a perspective. We want to talk about how we can love people better. You can't get any better than that. And so a God is going to be God glorified in that, honored in that. And the quicker you get on that train, it's not about Black Lives Matter. It is. I mean, th- th- that definitely is the slogan and that's the push. Right. And we, that's definitely the message. But, the, but our message as Christians is even higher than that, that you saying, listen, black lives are absolutely matter. And we are going to love them. We're going to know them. We're going to give them the love we want. And God is going to be glorified in black lives like never before, because we're going to, we, you know, the, the whatever role in oppression you play or, whatever, or not, but the oppressive cloud that has existed in this country, we are all going to do our part to remove it, that the glory yes. of God may reign in this world. And that, that to me is the hope. So we always got to keep our eyes on Jesus, that, that Jesus uh, is working something out and we got we to get part of what he is doing. And, and he is, th- let me tell you something, the justice that man is fighting for, good. God says, I got something even better than that. Yes. And that's what we're going Exactly right. And, uh, you know, I, I came out of the gate this morning and I said, Black Lives Matter. And then I went on to say, because, you know, if you go to the doctor, I've had 18 broke bones. A lot of them were of football and everything else. Some of them were just being a knucklehead, but I had a lot of broke bones in my life. And, uh, you know, when you walk in and, and your arm's crooked, uh, you, I say, I need you to give some attention to this broken arm right here. The doctor don't look at it and say, all bones matter. He, he pays attention to the bone that's broke. And the Bible says that. The Bible says that the body, when one part suffers, we all suffer. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. We, we, we've been, we, we're now entering into, I think, the first time of us seeing that a significant part of our brothers and sisters are suffering and our eyes are opened up to it. And hopefully the blood of Jesus can run to that just like a natural body and begin to bring healing to these relationships. I'm hopeful to that end, Pastor or I'm going to get out of this business and I need to go do something else because I'm a hypocrite. Or I get up every day and believe God can change it. And I'm believing that this, I'm believing that this, we may look back on it and it's going to be one of the greatest times we either dropped the ball or we had a chance to shine. I think that the latter is going to happen and not the former. I'm so grateful. Third option, guys, if you haven't gotten it, you need to get it. I'm so grateful that you gave me this time with you. You have represented, man, like a boss when you get on CNN and all these other places. I admire you. Now I'm only really right up the street from you, so hopefully we can hang out soon when some of this settles down. Thank you for being with me, Pastor. Any closing, any closing comments? I would just say this. The greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, mind, and soul, and the, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you give someone a title less than neighbor, white this, black this, thug, you know, immigrant, and you dehumanize them with that title, you in your heart have disqualified yourself from having to love them because they're not your neighbor. And yet you still would say you love God. I would encourage you every time you see someone, see them as your neighbor and treat them through the filter of them being your neighbor, your brother, your sister. And then your starting point is here. And and, and so that I would encourage you in that and say, Lord, I want to fulfill that. I just want to love people. I want to love people. If I love them, equality will happen. Justice will happen. Mm-hmm. All of these ills will be fixed. I got to love them with the love of Christ. And I'm going to start by, by acknowledging that they're made in the image of God, just like I'm made in the image of God. The image of God and either of us are the same. That's what I would say. Blessings to you. Much love to you. Third option is the book. We're giving some away. Go sign up for it now. Brother, more power to you. Blessings, and we'll be seeing you soon. God bless. Thank you.